Good time of day, guys! My name is Godzi, and welcome back to another episode of Higarashi When They Cry, Chapter 3, Tatari Garoshi. Last episode, Keiichi hid Tepe's body and ran into Takano, which was very interesting. The two hate each other. That's basically the, just the last episode. Uh, before I get into this episode, I just want to say I've got a cup of coffee because I am tired uh, hopefully me drinking it isn't too loud in this, but, yeah, uh, just figured I should warn you guys because sometimes I'm probably gonna take a break between lines to take a sip. It's too hot right now, so I'm gonna wait a few minutes, but, yeah, you know, just wanted to let you guys know that. So now we're gonna go into spoiler time, uh, for probably not very long because there's not too much to say about the new episode of Higurashi Go, but... You know, uh, we're just going into spoiler time right now. Let's do it. So, uh, I would probably have a decent amount to talk about regarding this episode, but I got a comment that basically said that was more or less an adaptation of how all that unfolded in Mina Garoshi. So, I'm gonna tr not think too hard about it unless, uh, because I don't really remember exactly how everything went down in Mina Garoshi. Uh, so, yeah. Um, <laughs> if anyone notices any differences, and I happen to catch wind of that, then maybe I'll say some more, because, like, there's parts where you, where Rika seems to be going Burncastle-ish, but not, like, full Burncastle like she did in Wata Damashi. And there's a few other things that kind of stand out, like, I don't know. I, I just don't really have much to say about it, honestly. All I can really say is I'm kind of, I was kind of right about Shion having more involvement because she showed up for, like, the majority of the episode and was a, a pretty big center point for a while. She hit Keiichi with a chair, which was interesting. <laughs> yeah, I don't really remember jack shit from Mina Garoshi, and I don't really know how it's going to continue from here. But I'm assuming at this point that my theory about both Shion and Keiichi trying to kill Tepe is probably not going to happen. It might still somehow, but I doubt it. That being said, let's get into it. <clears throat> Hi guys, welcome back. <laughs> at first, I thought it was a dream. I was staring at the strange sheet, not really understanding what it was. That was all. I didn't go after it, nor did I ridicule it. <clears throat> the fact was that the boring view was the ceiling of my own room, but I didn't realize that for a fairly long time. Yes, I thought I had been dreaming, but I had actually been staring at the ceiling the whole time. Lethargy, or lethargy, I don't know how that word's pronounced, induced by the voices of the cicadas. Even after I realized I was awake, I couldn't draw forth the energy to sit up. Everything I could see, everything I could hear, everything was like a television broadcast that had already ended. It was hot. Oh, crap. I'm just moving a coaster to the other side so I can grab my coffee with my other hand. Did I read that line? I did, okay. So hot I could choke on the heat. It's like Keiichi knows I'm going to be drinking coffee. My back was moist with night sweats, and it felt gross. There we go. Unable to endure it any longer, I tossed in my futon, and finally, blood started coursing through my brain. I lazily recalled the long day I had yesterday. The reality, as I lay here listening to the voices of the cicadas, and yesterday, so different from it. <clears throat> in order to kill Satoko's uncle, I had rehearsed formulated a plan, and dug a hole. It was very hot, and I was tired, wasn't I? And when evening came, I went to school and called him out on the phone. I panicked for a moment when he asked where the police station was, but it worked out. And then I awaited him, and swooped down. I couldn't remember anymore what sort of emotions I'd let control my body. In any case, it didn't go smoothly, but I did it. It was very hard to dig the hole for the body. That feel of the rain pelting down on me, I don't think I'll ever forget it. 
The rain, the mud, and the sprays of blood. The sensation of floundering in a swamp. When I met Takano-san on the way home, that wasn't good, no matter how I interpreted it. It was the most misfortunate and uncalculated thing that had happened that night. Everything would have been perfect, if only I hadn't encountered her. <sighs> I was just riding my bike, with my shovel in one hand, through the downpour, utterly soaked. There was no way someone could surmise I was a murderer burying a body just from that information. Now that I was thinking calmly, napping under the morning sun, that's what I thought. <clears throat> Still, the more I think about Takano-san's eyes, it seemed like she understood. Takano-san, she knew. That I had killed someone, buried them, and that I'd been on my way home, exhausted. Takano-san wouldn't gain anything from selling me out to the police, but that didn't mean I could feel at ease. I should have killed her. I had crossed such a bridge to get my tranquil life back and I'd finally achieved it as a result. But now, for the rest of my life, for all the tranquil days starting today, I'd have to live in fear of when they could suddenly end. I may have twisted my ankle, dulled from total exhaustion. The fact that I couldn't make the snap judgment I needed to, I regretted it more and more as time went on. You didn't have a choice, Keiichi Mayabara. You didn't have any choice at the time. You were tired. You were a mess. Even if you had made the decision, you might not have even been able to kill her. She might have just beaten you instead. In that sense, parting ways uneventfully could have been the safer option. No matter how sharp Takano-san's intuition was, she had no proof. Her suspecting me didn't amount to evidence by itself. Logically, I know that. But that doesn't mean I have nothing to worry about, does it? Just worry about it when the time comes. Now isn't the time to be worrying. It's the time to be smiling, right? You accomplished so much just to gain a new life starting today, didn't you? Then you should be happy at this new morning. If remembering the past is too hard for you, then just consider everything up to yesterday as having never happened. You said so yourself. You'd bury it all like it, ever, like it never happened. <clears throat> well, your wish came true. Everything before yesterday never happened. So be happy, Keiichi Mayabara. Yay. I stuck up my hands lazily. It felt a little silly for me to be the one doing it. I heaved a sigh from deep in my belly. That sigh got my lungs moving. It felt like I hadn't been breathing until just now. It wasn't enough to admonish myself over. All the dice that could be thrown already had been. And the numbers that turned up weren't bad at all. If I lost with those numbers, then I'd just have to give up, I guess. I grabbed the chest of my pajamas and flapped it back and forth. Cool air flowed over my sweating body. Okay. Nothing before yesterday happened. Nothing. Nothing at all. I'd forget it all. Yesterday was all a dream. I'm assuming this is probably mistranslated. Nothing before yesterday happened. I'm assuming that's supposed to imply Nothing, like yesterday didn't happen, I, I'm thinking. What time was that? About midday? Getting myself up and going to school this late seemed kind of absurd, but I needed to go. I felt like going to school would be the first step into my peaceful new life. I didn't care how late it was, I would go. I'd go to school right now and get back to the life I had retaken as soon as I could. My lazy body immediately became lighter at the thought. I rolled up out of the futon, bounced onto my knees, then leaped upright. Nice! Stuck the landing! I stuck out my chest with pride at my gymnast-like pose, then took a deep breath of fresh air. The brisk morning air had been gone for a while, replaced by the crisp air of summer. Downstairs, I got a stern talking to by my mother. Where were you last night? When did you get back? You need to tell me when you won't be home for dinner. Things like that. But considering the importance of what I'd accomplished yesterday, a little side, a little scolding was no problem. Hmm. In fact, it even felt like the sort of thing that would happen in such a peaceful life. <clears throat> I listened with an irresponsible smile, and stepped out into the sun high overhead. It was around the time lunch break would be ending. Everyone would 
probably be worrying about me. I didn't go to the festival, and now I wasn't at school. Well, maybe they weren't too worried about it. Since they would have gotten a small piece of news, but a happy one from Satoko today. Yes, the small piece of news that her uncle hadn't come home last night. Satoko would probably live her days in nervous tension for a while, thinking he might still come home. But eventually, those days would end. And finally, Satoko, too, would realize her uncle was never coming back. And then, Rika-chan would quietly invite her. She would say, you can live with me again, and everything would be back to normal. Our lives would go back to how they were before that man appeared. Satoko would start wearing that extraordinary smile, complete with those protruding canines. What is it with teeth in this chapter, I swear to God? And fool everyone with those traps she was so proud of. I'd probably be her first target out of everyone, but I wouldn't be mad. In fact, I might actually shed tears of joy at the returning of something so normal. Satoko. She'd gradually grow back into that meddlesome personality of hers. I mean, my lack of useful life skills was already completely exposed. I wondered if I'd ever be a match for Satoko, but that would be such a pleasant thing to see, too. And with such warm, fuzzy predictions, I didn't feel bad for going to school so late. In fact, I wanted to run there now to get there as soon as I could. Instead, I decided to savor the peacefulness of just going to school like normal, without running. The world I had obtained for myself, that gave me joy just by walking like this. Yes, the world beginning on this very day was something I had won. Without that monumental feat yesterday, I would never have been able to come to school so cheerfully today. The school gate came into sight, and then I heard the principal ringing the bell to mark the end of lunch break. It was a queer, refreshing sound. I stopped despite myself, and let myself take it in. <clears throat> Tap. I had stopped suddenly, so there was an extra footstep. Mm. That again. With the noise, the blessedness I was feeling throughout my whole body withdrew into any pore it could find. And as if to replace it, I felt like hundreds of hairy caterpillars were climbing up my feet. I turned back, but of course, nobody was there. A single footstep could have easily been my imagination, but the footstep felt so ominous. That extra footstep I had heard after seeing Takano-san off last night. With everything that happened on that insane night, I didn't mind something like that happening once. It had been a hell of a night after all. In fact, having just one hallucination was pretty fortunate. But those footsteps should have ended with yesterday. So if I heard them again today, there was really only one thing it could have meant. Last night still wasn't over. It was still going. Still. That insane night forever. The step I heard, just that one extra footstep, was quietly, quietly ridiculing the nonsensical notion that the world starting today was completely different from the one that ended yesterday. My classmates playing in the schoolyard all vanished inside like the tide going out. When I approached the school, it felt like that warm, fuzzy scene had ended, and it didn't feel good. At the entrance, I took a quick look in everyone's shoeboxes. Satago Hojo. She was here. Mion was here too. And Rena, of course. Even Rika-chan was here. Tomi Takun and Okamura-kun were here. In fact, I didn't see any missing classmates. If there were shoes missing, they would have to be my own. I took my shoes off and stuck them in, then took out some slippers. There wasn't a single pair left in the shoeboxes anymore. With that, they returned to their rightful state. But as I stepped up onto the wooden floor, I noticed there was just one pair of slippers left. Huh. Whose? Satoshi. Hojo. Hmm. Satoshi, who had never been to school since disappearing last year. Until now, we had committed the exact same act of violence, but I guess in the very end, it went differently. You couldn't make it to school, but here I am. I didn't repeat the same mistake you made. I wasn't about to let myself feel superior about that. In fact, I felt an odd sense of familiarity with him. 
a misfortunate bond with someone I never met due to following the same fate. I headed down the hallway towards the usual classroom. It felt like it had been a whole year since coming here. Hey, did you forget Keiichi Mayabara? Satoshi Hojo didn't really disappear on the night of Watanagashi, did he? Satoshi Hojo disappeared a few days later. On Satago's birthday, if I was right. I didn't know what day it was, but I couldn't say for sure I'd avoided Satoshi's failure unless I remained here past that day. I was still living in that night of insanity. The teacher still hadn't come to the classroom. The other door clattered open, the one the teacher wouldn't use, so everyone turned at once to see who would have arrived. Everyone looked pretty vac vacant. Mm. Suppose I'll greet them. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. I do thank you for coming all the way out here today. Foo 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 foo. T Silence. When I started to think I'd fallen flat, someone finally started laughing for me. <laughs> Good morning, Kei chan. You're pretty energetic today. Yeah, energetic. Maybe you haven't gotten out of the festival mood, festive mood yet. Huh? Hearing Mion and Rena's cheerful voices made me realize how dumb those dark feelings I'd been having at the entrance really were. Hey now, festive mood? I wasn't at the festival at all, remember? Before I could say that, Rika-chan smiled at me. Coffee sip. Delicious. Keiichi, did you make sure to watch my dance? Yep, he saw it just fine. Didn't you see how big an applause he gave you? This is weird. And he ignored it when that troublemaker Shion came up and made a pass at him. <laughs> Take that, Shion! Wow, that felt good. Mion starts laughing at the memory as she slaps me a few times on the back. Hello, Tomita. So, how did that target practice contest turn out in the end? Tomita-kun was facing me and talking. There was nobody behind me. That meant he was talking to me? Tomitake turned up dead last. Everyone had a good time with his punishment game. <laughs> Weren't you supposed to be the one in last place, Rika-chan? It was such a turnaround when you pulled off getting that chewing gum. I should have expected that from a member of my club. It was fantastic! <laughs> Crying at a time like this... Okay. Is he supposed to be talking right now? Uh, let's just assume he is. Crying at a time like that is a feat only Furude would be allowed to do, said Okamura-kun, breathing heavily from his nose. Why do they format it like this sometimes? In my direction, everyone laughed. If anyone but Rika-chan had done it, it would have been against the rules. Rika-chan gave one of her knee-paw smiles as she listened to it. In my direction. Rena too, turned to me. No, turned towards me. And then, with a somewhat embarrassed smile, she whispered to me so only I could hear. But, really? Thanks, Keiichi Kun. For what? That giant stuffed animal. I was really happy. It's nice and safe right at my bedside. And I made sure to give it a goodnight kiss before bed, too. <laughs> the class laughed at that, cheering and jeering. This whole time, the conversation had been a little bit off. I wasn't quite getting it. What's this about a stuffed animal? <laughs> What's this? Come on, we all worked really hard at the festival yesterday to get it down. Remember? The gigantic stuffed animal. The gigantic stuffed animal. Rena seemed taken aback, but when she answered, she did it with a smile. We were having a hard time knocking it over, so we tried aiming at the forehead and rapid-fire shooting and stuff. And then, Keiichi Kun, you got a whole bunch of guns ready beforehand and shot them all! It was so cool. Huh? Wait, who was this? Yeah, I don't remember this fucking shit at all. What the hell? All the people in the neighborhood association, including the chairman, were praising you so much at the party afterwards. One of them said he'd fallen in love with your way with your way with words. Tokuzo Kimiyoshi, 
the chairman of the children's committee, I think. He said he wanted you to wanted you to entrust you with a few of the stalls at the next festival. That sentence was very weird. Tokizo is the chair of the of the refreshment booths. He's on the festival executive committee. I can't read today at all. <laughs> My Ibarra-san is great at making things sound good, isn't he? Yep, whenever he talks about something, it seems a lot better than it actually is. <laughs> you can't say that. <laughs> Keiji-kun, you'd make a great salesman. I bet you'd do great auctioning off overripe bananas or something. What have you been talking about? I mean, I... Didn't go to the festival in the first place. I swallowed those words. I didn't know exactly why, but in Hinamizawa, this is what had happened. Yesterday, during the Watanagashi Festival, Keiichi Mayabara had appeared, and he had romped about with all the usual members of his club. He made a big scene at a few of the stalls, snatched a few sticks of takoyaki and okonomiyaki in his glee, rating each of them as delicious or terrible to get everyone excited. And they'd seen a gigantic stuffed animal at the target practice game, and everyone went after it. And then I got a whole bunch of the cork guns, firing them in rapid succession, throwing each one away after using it. And admirably, I shot down the biggest stuffed animal there. And then I gave the stuffed animal, the proof of my victory, to Rena as a gift. Then our fun came to a close, as we had to go see Rika-chan's offertory dance. There was a ton of people squeezed in there, and we all got separated, but we each managed to get into good positions to cheer Rika-chan on from. Then in the middle, when Shion came up and asked me to go hang out with her instead of watching the dedication dance, I refused, and stayed put, watching the dance until the very end. God, my chair is in such a weird position. But who? Who was that? Well, everyone's been saying it, haven't they? Keiichi Mayabara. I had an urge to yell in anger at my classmates for having so much fun talking about the festival yesterday with Keiichi Mayabara. What the hell are you guys even talking about? Far stronger than that feeling, though, was the sheer uncanny nature of this reality I couldn't understand. A Keiichi Mayabara who wasn't me was in Hinamizawa yesterday. As I threw away my humanity, turned into a demon, and was busy beating Satoko's uncle to death. I was having a great time at the festival last night. What the hell? I had to suffer through so much, desperately holding back tears, getting so worn out in that downpour, digging holes, chasing, beating, killing, dragging, and burying. Who was this Keiichi Mayabara who had ignored me so and spent such a fun, carefree time at the festival, damn it? Who the hell stood in for me, as I put my life on the line working so hard to achieve this treasure-like everyday life? If there was another Keiichi Mayabara besides me, then what was I? On the night of Watanagashi, where one died and one disappeared, in accordance with Oyashiro-sama's curse, there was only a demon who had killed someone. Hmm. I understand. I get it. I mean, I get what he's going with here. I don't understand what actually happened. <laughs> like, there's an idea, but it likely is not correct. <laughs> but, yeah, I don't really remember this scene in the first place, so, yeah. Dumbfounded as I succumbed to a horrifying possibility, I looked around at my classmates. To make sure there was nobody extra I didn't recognize among them. To make sure... I wasn't among them. It was a horrifying thought that the real Keiichi Mayabara hadn't overslept and had come to school on time, and that I, who was no longer Keiichi Mayabara, had just waltzed in here. But no matter how much I checked, the only people here were ones I knew. The man I met every time I looked in a bathroom mirror was not here. Okay, everyone. Time to start afternoon classes. Please take your seats. President, please lead the class. The teacher entered and everyone hurried back to their seats. Upon finding me, who was so stupidly late, she gave me a stern talking to, but I wasn't listening to it. 
Wasn't our old life supposed to start today? Something wasn't right. It was just strange. I was supposed to go back to my old, fun life after yesterday. I had set foot in an incomparably mis mysterious world that was completely different from both my old life and my recent one. Yes, this was, without a doubt, a different world than the one I'd been living in until now. There was no way such an absurd thing could be possible. But unless it was true, I couldn't explain anything that just happened. In this classroom, I was surrounded by so many faces I knew, and yet I felt isolated. The cicadas sounded no different than they had before now, but they seemed somehow false. The air was parched and dry, too, making me think, was the air in Hinamizawa always this uncomfortable? And they haven't shown Satoko yet, either. Hey, Rena. What is it? We're in class. About the festival yesterday. About... when would you say I got there? Huh? To be honest, I was pretty excited afterwards, and I gobbled down some cans of beer. I mean, it's kind of embarrassing, but I don't quite remember some things. For a random babbling, it wasn't a bad excuse. Keiji-kun, you said you couldn't come at first, didn't you? You called Michon's house about it, right? That matched. I called Mion and told her to take Satoko in my place, since I wouldn't be able to meet up with them due to things I had to do. We all decided while we were setting up for the festival that we'd invite Satoko-chan. We wanted to bring her out someplace where she couldn't see her uncle for a little while. That was the same too. Mion said that when I called her, that everyone had already decided to invite her. And then we all went, me, Michan, and Rika-chan to Satoko-chan's house and brought her out. Satoko-chan's uncle seems like a really mean person. That part didn't matter. What I was trying to ask was... I... well... When did I meet up with you? How could you forget that? Keiichi-kun, this is why I said to get a good night's sleep before the festival. Whatever! When did I meet up with you? Uh, um... well... At my sudden, threatening demand, Rana was at a loss for words. Oops, I shouldn't have rushed that. I told her I was sorry. It was at the Shrine Grounds. It was unexpected. You were talking to Rika-chan, weren't you? Oh, okay, no, no, no. Now I, I think I understand then, maybe? I think? We're going into spoiler time because I think I understand what's going on now. Uh, spoilers for the original anime. Hanyu, right? I don't remember if Hanyu had the ability to transform into other people, but at the Shrine Grounds, it was a surprise. Keiichi doesn't remember it. It's still the same timeline. It's not like he went into a different one. Uh, it's not like he got caught in the time loop on accident. Um, Rika was talking to Hanyu, and Hanyu disguised herself as Keiichi uh, in order to pass it off. Or maybe Rika knew what Keiichi was doing and had Hanyu do that? I don't know. Like, just to give him an alibi? I have no fucking clue. Maybe... Th there's a number of things... There's a number of rationales there. Uh, I was initially thinking maybe it was Satoshi, but then obviously not, because he's still trapped in the laboratory. Because that would still... That would still be in the realm of delusion, obviously. But if it was Hanyu, that makes a lot... That could be a... That could make a lot more sense. Because Hanyu is technically supposed to be Oyashiro-sama. So, it would make sense if it were Hanyu. And, yeah. Also, the uh, set of footsteps he hears is probably... Judging by the whole thing with uh, in Watanagashi with Shion and Tomatake, hearing a child jumping on floorboards in the shrine, that being Hanyu, the footsteps is Hanyu also. And Hanyu's probably also who caused... Uh, Keiichi to, like, break the shoebox in Oni Kakushi. I, for I constantly forget things about this game, but now I'm remembering more. So, hell yeah. So that's probably what happened. I'm guessing. Welcome back. Yep. You were having a fun talk with Rika-chan in her Shrine Maiden outfit. And then Rena came up and said, Hey, I'm taking you home. I was talking... 
to Rika-chan. And I asked, Kei-chan, didn't you have something to do today? Then you pounded your chest and said it yourself. That letting loose of the festival was more important than some silly errand. I didn't say that. I never said anything like that. I never even went to the shrine grounds yesterday to begin with. I never had the time to stop by a place like that. I went to dig the hole as soon as I woke up. I had a pretty hard time doing it. After that, I snuck into the school and made a call. I called him out and lay in wait. And then it started raining really hard. With that kind of downpour, the festival should have come to a halt. In other words, it ended then. From the time the festival started to when it ended, it would have been impossible for me to have swung by the shrine grounds. I was already there when Mion and the others dragged Satoko out and brought her to the shrine, and I was talking to Rikachan. Then, where would Rikachan say we met? The teacher went out to wash her hands, so I ran over to Rikachan's desk and asked her directly. With you? Yeah. We were talking to each other before Mion and the others got there, right? When did we see each other? When? And where? I don't know what you're trying to ask. You know, yesterday I didn't really get enough sleep and my head's a bit fuzzy. I don't remember a thing. <laughs> it looked like Rikachan bought into my babbling. We saw each other when the mayor and the others came out of the assembly hall. You were in front of the Ritual Implement Storehouse. Huh? What? The Ritual Implement Storehouse? I never heard a building called that before. Or maybe I have, but at the very least, I wouldn't know where on the shrine grounds it was. The mayor got real angry at you, since you shouldn't go near holy places without authority, remember? Keiichi, did you forget that too? I was too scared to ask anymore. The more I asked, the more it became clear without any doubt that Keiichi Mayabara was present at the Furude Shrine Grounds during the Watanagashi Festival. The queerer that became, the more doubts, no, fears I had. Who on earth was I yesterday? Whoever that was, he had a good time in my place, and managed to go the entire day without letting them notice I wasn't there. Oh, right. When did that person leave everyone? This morning, my mother got mad at me for having stayed out so late last night, which meant at the very least that Keiichi Mayabara hadn't come home while my mother was still awake. The festival would have been closed because of the downpour. R if I recall right, when I went back to the house's storage room to get another shovel, I think the clock said 7. Since it was already raining hard by then, the festival would have had to close down before 7. If I'd returned that early, I would have definitely run into my parents. Or at the very least, they wouldn't have asked me when I got back last night. So the Keiichi Mayabara from yesterday, that meant he never went home. That meant the downpour happened, the festival was broken up, everyone left. But he didn't go back to the house. Um, that means... When I arrived at the natural conclusion, a wicked chill suddenly froze my spine and climbed up to my brain. That meant Keiichi Mayabara was the same as Satoshi. One day, he never went home. On the night of Watanagashi, he never went home. The downpour interrupted the festival, and on the way home, he suddenly disappeared. And I, who was dealing with the corpse, went home without a problem. I was so tired I wasn't even hungry, so I went up to my room without a sound and crawled into my futon. Who was I? That much was obvious. Keiichi Mayabara. Keiichi Mayabara was me. There may have been another one, but that doesn't negate the fact that I was Keiichi Mayabara. Then... That other Keiichi Mayabara was... what? The voices of the cicadas, steadily filling the classroom, were beginning to bother me. Suddenly, I laid eyes on Satoko. Satoko's expression was dark as always. She seemed completely exhausted, at a life of agony she couldn't even imagine an ending to. Hmm. So she is still here? What had last night been like for Satoko? Did she have fun with everyone and feel a little happier, if even for a moment? And when she went home, the end of her dream, she'd probably gone to sleep afraid of when her uncle would return. 
And then, this morning, her uncle hadn't come home. And then she went to school. Right now, she must have been still trapped by the rotten idea from which she couldn't be saved, that her uncle would need her when she got back. But you can rest easy, Satako. Your uncle won't ever be coming back. I couldn't tell her it was because I'd killed him. When Satago realized on her own that her uncle would never return, then that would truly be the end of the long, insane night. That's right. I didn't do anything wrong. I did the best possible thing I could have as Satago's Nini. Not an atom in my body regretted it. And look, calm down and think, Keiichi Mayabara. From a certain point of view, isn't it convenient there was another Keiichi Mayabara? I buried the corpse perfectly. A beginning wouldn't happen, but if worse came to worse and it got out and the investigation got to me, I now had a strong alibi, able to profess the fact that I'd been at the Watanagashi Festival. But accepting something so creepy and using it as an alibi... Still, if I proved I hadn't gone to the festival yesterday, it would do no good and a whole lot of harm. That was what left the really, actually bad aftertaste. You'll forget about it, Keiichi Mayabara. Everything that happened before today. So, just forget about the Keiichi Mayabara who was there yesterday, too. Coffee time. Nice. Instead, let's watch gently over Satoko for the, for, the, for the day her smile returns. And the day that would mark the end of that insane, all-too-long night. Ring-a-ding-ding. I really don't remember how this chapter continues. Like, we're past the point now where I remember what happens. Like, <laughs> I don't remember a goddamn thing else about how the rest of this chapter goes, how close we are to the end, if we are, how it ends. Like, yeah, the difference with Oni Kakushi is that I remembered basically everything. Uh, not in the exact order, but I remembered basically everything. In Watanagashi, I had at least a vague idea of how it ended. This chapter, not a clue. Like, not a fucking clue, so that's great. Coffee time. I'm trying to be quiet about it, but I swallow very loud for, uh, compared to the average person. I don't know why I do, I don't know how the fuck to swallow quieter, but, uh, I'm not doing that intentionally, in case you're wondering. <laughs> that's all for today, class. Please go straight back to your homes, everyone. President, if you would. Everybody stand up! At attention! Bow! Goodbye! I thought about many things, and saw my thoughts dispersed by many other things. My dog's barking, so that's great. I didn't know whether or not that, that time had been spent worrying or daydreaming, but either way, it came to an end along with the class. Cheerfully, our classmates got their things and ran for the hallway. Mion, Rena, and Rikachan were packing up as well. What about Satoko? This whole day, she seemed deflated. Well, her uncle may not have returned last night, but she wouldn't have known he'd never return. How much I wanted to express that fact to her. Satago packed up her pencil box and math workbook messily, and after a dark glance at the clock, heaved a sigh. Then went to leave the classroom. Then, suddenly, somebody placed a hand on her shoulder and stopped her. What is it? I watered the plants like I was supposed to, and got all the printouts done. Her words, possessed by a persecution complex, hurt. I spoke loudly so everyone could hear. Hey, everyone! Why don't, why don't we have club, club today? It's been a while. Satoko always had to tend to her uncle, so club has been on hiatus. In our minds, our club was proof of a calm, peaceful life. By enjoying being together, I wanted to make Satoko realize her days of darkness were over. I'm okay. I'll do it. Meep. Well, I mean, I don't mind. If it's okay with Satoko. Under a condition. That was important. With everything up to her, Satoko gave a worried look. Come on, Satoko. It's been a long time. Let's go crazy. Well... I'm happy you feel that way, but... My uncle might already be home. Thus spoke her darkened eyes, her mouth unmoving. You've been choking on life every day for a while. You must be about to suffocate. It's not good for your mind or body. 
Once in a while, you've gotta have some fun! Please, leave it alone. It's not like I don't want to do club again. With one word, but... She looked down. Santico, you know as well as anyone that it's more fun being with everyone, right? We're friends! That means we can spend time with each other. I mean, you had a great time at the festival yesterday with everyone, didn't you? Rena nearly said something, but she was too late. Keiji-san, what are you saying? My arm on her shoulder seemed to weigh her down, and she threw it off. When exactly was I playing and having fun at the festival? The only one having fun was you, Keiji-san. Huh? I looked over to Mion for help, but now everyone was looking down. My instincts told me that Satoko hadn't gone to the festival. But Rena said it herself, that she went with Mion to Satoko's house to invite her. Satoko-chan left on the way there. She didn't go to the shrine. W why? I realized the absurdity of what I just said with Satoko in front of me. She said her uncle was waiting at home, and she couldn't have fun by herself when we were in front of the shrine. We, we tried to stop her too. We told her her uncle said it was okay and that he wouldn't get mad if she had a good time. At some point, tears had begun welling up in Satoko's eyes. Satoko was so afraid of her uncle that she couldn't even allow herself time with her friends and went home. No, she was even afraid of letting herself have a good time with her friends. Keiji-san, you must have it nice, having a blast at the festival all night. They told me you went all out, didn't you? I'm very envious. Smiling to herself, her tears began to fall. Aw. I must provide for my uncle. It's completely different from you, with how you let your parents do everything. Satoko. I'm so glad you enjoyed yourself at the festival. I'm so glad you had enough fun for me, too. I mean, I want to participate in the club, too. Making such a racket with everyone is so much fun. But right now, I can't. I can't. Unable to withstand such violent emotion, a few teardrops slid down her cheek. But even though she was having such a terrible time, not once did she ever say that it was hard for her. It was a sad, obstinate bravery. But the days when Satoko had to feel like that were over. Satoko didn't need to. To endure it. To bear it anymore. She, forget, she could forget all about it now. And smile. I was so frustrated at not being able to tell her that directly. Instead, I said something that I'm not sure I should have said before I thought twice about it. He didn't come home, did he? The words were deeply meaningful to me, but I didn't know if Satoko understood them. Didn't come home? Who? He didn't come home last night, did he? Drunkle? What are you talking about, Keiji-san? Satoko shouted with all her might. When has he not been there? When? When? Calm down. I mean, he didn't come home yesterday, did he? I don't understand what you're trying to say, Keiji-san! Satoko, what are you talking about? I mean, that man, I... I killed him. Killed him yesterday. Killed him for sure. And I buried him. Buried him whole. He could never have returned to his house. Even yesterday, he was torturing me so much! He yelled at me! He shouted at me! He found fault with everything I did! He threw the dinner I made him on the floor! He dumped his bowl of miso soup on me, too. It was hot. It was messy. And I cleaned all of it up. I cleaned all of it. <laughs> I can't do crying sounds. Like, the rest is fine, but... Coffee. Oh, shit. What? Our stories weren't matching up. He... Uh, night? What? And this morning, when he woke me up to make him breakfast, he got so mad at me. He would have gotten mad at me whether I'd gotten up or not. <laughs> Satoko. Hi, Rika. 
Rikachan went over to Satoko and said a few words of consolation. But Satoko angrily refused those words and thrust Rikachan away. Nini! Nini! Come back! Come back! <laughs> Crying, Satoko slowly walked out into the hallway. After a moment, Rikachan went after her. I couldn't stop thinking about the words Satoko had spoken while crying. I buried her uncle last night, but she said this morning that was impossible. I buried him last night, so she couldn't have seen her uncle this morning. What was... what was Satoko? I think I have an idea of what's going on then? Perhaps. At that point, I heard Mion's cold voice. Hey, Kei-chan, what did you mean about Satoko's uncle? Gulp. I said too much. I let my emotions get the better of me. Rena heard it too. You said Satoko chan's uncle didn't come home. Why? Why didn't he come home? That's strange. Satoko chan's uncle was right there this morning, wasn't he? So why would you say he didn't come back? Come back! Okay, chan, you've been saying some weird things for a while. Suddenly, Mion and Rena started to speak in strange and creepy voices. What were they doing? What were they saying? Oh shit, okay, well, this is a bit more obvious as what's going on, I guess. Okay, chan this is somehow inconvenient for you for Satoko's uncle to be around. You... No, what are you talking about? Uh, and we're back to the SNES music, awesome. Of course it would be better if Satoko's uncle wasn't here. Yep, that's true, of course. If only he weren't here, right? <laughs> something... something wasn't right. The next thing I knew, Mion and Rena were smiling thinly. Their eyes were dark and muddy, in a way that I'd never seen before. And as our eyes met, that mud even seemed to fill the air. Satago's uncle is an awful person, no doubt. I think we'd all be better off with him gone just as much as you do. But he's here. There's nothing we can do, right? Nothing we can do. Something's wrong. Something's queerly wrong here. What the hell was happening? After a moment, a chilly, liquid-like feeling, as though my blood had been mixed with sherbet, sher sherbet, crawled up my spine. No choice. I mean, of course there isn't, but... But then Satsuka will never... If there's no choice, what would you do? Ugh. Rena was trying to prompt me to say more. There really was no choice, so I killed him. I killed him to protect Satoko. That's... <clears throat> Leave him alone. I think things will resolve themselves soon enough. <clears throat> Satoko-chan said her uncle was here, so he's here. He was here yesterday, and he's here today. She said so, so it's fine, right? Right? Mion and Rana were speaking unbelievably dismissively. How could they be talking like that? Mion and Rana, they were my friends, and were seriously worried about, uh oh, about Satago's abuse, weren't they? They would never blurt out something like this! And I definitely killed Satago's uncle. No matter what Satago or anyone else says, I wouldn't acknowledge it, because him being alive was impossible. There's no way he was alive. It was impossible. And yet, since Satoko herself said he was here, then he was alive. I didn't know why or how, but suddenly, Mion and Rena were at my sides, standing there silently. Let's go home, Kei-chan. After we leave, Rena wants to go treasure hunting for the first time in a while. Mi-chan is coming too. Kei-chan, you should come along. Of course, you're not allowed to refuse. If words could freeze blood, then there was no doubt that they would have frozen me solid. I could hear it. A strange sound, like a layer of thin ice spreading, emanating from every joint in my body. And with them closely at my sides, we left the school as if they were police officers taking me away. Hmm. They talked about silly things the entire way home, like they always did, 
but they always stood at my sides, as if to prevent me from escaping. This was strange. Everything about this day was strange. Actually, it had been strange ever since the previous night. Yes, thinking back, it had been strange ever since killing Satoko's uncle. That creepy man meeting with Takano-san. The creepy meeting with, with Takano-san was only the beginning. That insane night was still continuing. Yes, it still hadn't ended. What? What's wrong, Kei-chan? Why did you suddenly stop? Uh, sorry. It's nothing. When I stopped, it was distant, but I definitely heard them. An extra set of footsteps. That was proof. Proof that, proof that insane night hadn't ended. Mion left where she usually did, and finally we came to my house. Okay, Keiichi Kun. Wait here for me. Red will come to pick you up soon. What was it? She was inviting me along on one of her oversized garbage treasure hunts at the dam site, right? But why now? Mion coming along was strange, too. Mion may have accepted Rena's little hobby, but she hated fishing through garbage, so she'd never come with her before. And the location, specifically being the dam site, was a little creepy. The dam construction site was completely outside the flow of everyday life. It was so remote that no one ever went there unless they thought to in particular. Nobody lived there, and there were no lights, so at night it got dark very quickly. I was being forcibly invited there. There was no reason I had to fear Rena and Mion. Besides, wouldn't the trouble I'd make by refusing them be a pain to deal with? In that way, it didn't seem like going treasure hunting with them was a bad idea. But that insane night was continuing. Haven't the sirens of instinct been wailing in my mind for a while now? Warning me that Rena and Mion were strange. That I needed to be cautious. The warning sirens were so freaking loud, it felt like my head would split in two. Uh, Rena, I, I actually have something to do. Something to do? Like what? Like what? It's I just have something to do, okay? If you had something to do, why didn't you say it while Michan was here? I already told her to meet us at the dam site before we split up. Rena was smiling, but her words made her discomfort clear. Sorry, I just kind of missed the opportunity to say so. Really? You're lying, aren't you? You just made that up now, you liar. That's what Rena's eyes said to me. Um, I... My uh, head hurts. I might have a cold, so... I wanted to go get it checked out and get some medicine. Nope. Oh. Really? That wasn't really a lie. My head did hurt a little bit, so I wasn't lying. Rena, she couldn't figure out if my head hurt or not, just by looking at it. Then, I guess that's that. After staring me in the eyes for a few moments, she fired a sharp, needle-like stare at me. The tension in my body loosened, and I felt like my knees might buckle. If you're going to the clinic, then you should go soon. Sometimes they close early. Thanks. I'll do that. Make sure you go, okay? To the hospital. I... I will. Go. For real. I will. It seemed like Rena had realized that I was going to refuse her invitation for a while now. With how serious she looks, she might actually call the clinic later to make sure I went. I couldn't say anything careless. Lying about getting checked out was just an excuse to decline her request in the first place. It didn't matter whether I actually went. Yeah. I'll go. If you want, I can bring you the bill tomorrow. Oh, that would be good. Be sure to bring it, okay? Rena will look at it then. Another tingle started crawling up my back. There was no ignoring it. Rena and Mion must have been monitoring my movements. That wasn't normal. Far from it. All of it was insane. I did what I did because I wanted my peaceful life back. But what... What on earth was all this? It was far from peaceful. Something had gone mad, leaving the world out of order. With the other, Keiichi Mayabara. With those creepy footsteps I've been hearing. With Rena and Mion acting so curious. And above all, with him being alive. 
Where was I? Hinamizawa Village, Shishibone. I knew that much. Was this really the Hinamizawa I knew? Hey, Keiichi Mayabara. Where is this? I asked, whipping around before the front door to face the one who has been following in my wake all day. Nobody would have been there, of course. Keiichi Mayabara, huh? That's what I just called him. Calling the one who had been trailing behind me this whole time. That shadowy presence, always clinging to me, like it was constantly w watching for the opportunity to change places. Footsteps always following me. It was another impossibility. It couldn't have been a ghost, so it was just impossible. So the strangeness must have been my ears, my head, or Hinamizawa. Everything I could see was the same exact Hima Hinamizawa I knew so well. And that gave me the creeps. Eventually, I decided to actually go to the clinic. I really didn't want to go outside, but a stronger feeling than that desire was the fear that was the fear Rena might actually be keeping an eye on me to see if I went to the hospital. But before I went to the clinic, there was something I wanted to make sure of. It was at school. I pretended I'd forgotten something and was going back to the classroom to pick it up. As soon as the thought crossed my mind, I was overwhelmed by paranoia. I was just going to the classroom, but I hated it so much, having to be so careful to fake it. I think I know what he's probably doing. Yeah. After carefully verifying once more that nobody was watching, I went over to the locker. Yes, Satoshi's locker. I committed the crime with the bat I found in this locker, Satoshi's bat. And then, I had thrown the bat into the swamp, which meant the bat shouldn't have been inside. But... but... what if... the bat was still in here? It was a very dreadful, incomprehensible idea, but if it was true, it would explain a lot. If the bat was in here, yesterday's events would have all been a delusion. No, an illusion. I hadn't killed anyone, and I'd gone to the festival. I had a great time rampaging about with everyone. It would prove that Keiichi Mayabara was really me. Proof that I was only under some strange assumption that I had killed Satago's uncle. Proof that it had all been a wild fantasy. That would explain everything. Nothing happened yesterday. I had just gone mad, unable to separate my shocking, uncle-killing dream from reality. That would explain everything. If the bat was here, would I be able to accept that reality? If it was here, nothing will have changed. If it was here, it would just mean I'd gone crazy. Preparing myself for the worst, I opened the locker door. I was actually scared of opening it slowly, so I threw it open with a bang. And just like the first time, the choking scent of smell and sweat like a stale towel came flowing out. There was a baseball uniform, and some miscellaneous other things, like notebooks. There was also a shoe pouch. And as for the bat, it wasn't here. It was how I left it when I took the bat out. There was no doubt, yesterday really happened. Now that I knew I wasn't a lunatic, I felt relieved. Well, you did kill someone, dude. Like, <laughs> you're a bit of a lunatic. Just, just the slightest bit. Just the, you know, just the teeniest bit. Just, just, just a small little bit, you know. But at the same time, if I wasn't the crazy one, then Hinamizawa was. And that was evidence of a reality I found just as difficult to accept. Well, technically speaking, dude, it is more likely that one person out of, let's just be conservative and say a thousand, are crazy than 999 out of a thousand. Like, take any sample size of people. Uh... And, well, you know. This is kind of a stupid way to describe it, but in order to prove that something, like, that a demographic of people are a minority, you'd have to take random sample sizes and determine whether they are part of that demographic or a different one. And then, if the majority of the sample sizes that you take have that group in the minority, then they are overall a minority. That's how it works. Like, that's how left-handedness works. Like, take a sample size of 10,000 people around the world, find how many of them are left-handed, 
and just do like, I don't know, a billion random samples. Well, that would that would imply that there's 10,000 billion people in the on the planet, which there aren't, so do a million instead. Because 10,000 million would be a billion, right? I think. Um, no, that would be like 10 billion. Doesn't matter. You get what I'm trying to say. <laughs> there was noise somehow creeping into everything I saw, and the world was losing a tiny bit of color. So, what did I know about last night now? Now that I'd made sure the bat wasn't there, I didn't need to be here anymore. Shall I go? For real, to the hospital. It was my first time going to the hospital, but from what I'd heard, it wasn't far from school. My mom had told me where it was. A big, easy-to-see road went straight there. I went past the shopping street, made a turn. It wasn't overly hard to spot the sign with Erie A Clinic written on it. There was one other person, an older man, there in the air-conditioned waiting room. I went up to the counter and told them it was my first time here. The man behind the counter glanced at the clock and said there would be a short wait. It was almost five. Clinic hours would be ending soon. As I sat in this unfamiliar waiting room, isolated from everyone, and let myself feel the cool air, I actually felt relieved. What should I tell the doctor when he comes? I could tell him I had a cold, but I was the very picture of health. Actually, I wanted him to check my head. I wanted someone to confirm for me whether I was really sane or not. Hello. Keiichi Mayabara-san, please come into the examination room. Huh? The voice from the other side of the examination curtain. I thought I'd heard it somewhere before. Hello. <laughs> Alright, well, I think I'm gonna end things here for now. We're a little bit over an hour, so I think that's good enough for an episode. Uh, feel free to tell me how much is left of this chapter so I can, like, plan accordingly. Because this chapter's been going on for a short while, so far. If there's still, like, at least an hour left of this one, maybe, then, like, I can finish up this part next episode, and then, like, Maybe there will be, like, one or two after that. I, I don't know. I have no fucking clue how long it'd be. But, yeah. Either way, I guess that's gonna be it for this episode, guys. If you liked it, then be sure to press the like button. And if you didn't like it, then fuck you too. Remember to subscribe, follow me on Twitter, and hit that notification bell to stay up to date on all my videos and stuff. And as always, my name is Godzi. And I will see you all next time. Goodbye. Yeah.